Hi everyone, you're watching the Virtual Amicus, and I'm Jay Lodha. Well, today is indeed a very special day because in today's episode, I am absolutely delighted, thrilled, and so honored to be in conversation with the very honourable, respected Professor Ohoma Pithawala sir, who needs absolutely no formal introduction, and uh, he's definitely a, a distinguished jurist. So, and just to give you all a brief introduction about our Amicus for today's session. Uh, Professor Pithawala sir has been a practicing advocate of the Honorable Supreme Court of India, Bombay High Court, as well as a solicitor of Bombay High Court, Supreme Court of England and Wales, and Supreme Court of Hong Kong. Sir is also a senior most professor of law at Government Law College, Mumbai, recognized as one of India's leading experts on corporate law and competition law. Mm -hmm. Sir has lectured at Harvard Law School, Law School at La Sorbonne, Paris, in France, the University of Cambridge. the international bar association the institute of chartered accountants and the institute of chartered secretaries so was also invited by the royal government of bhutan to draft contract law for their country so students include supreme court and high court judges including one chief justice of india attorney general advocate general ministers and advocates all over the world so it's indeed a matter of great honor for me and my team to record this session featuring professor homa pithawala sir so thank you so much uh, for taking out time and for doing this session and the topic for today's session would be on the law of contracts uh, wherein sir will be giving us or to all the viewers a birds eye view of the law of contracts discussing basics fundamentals and e contracts in particular so sir uh, the stage is set sir the floor is all yours over to you sir Thank you, thank you, Jay. It's always a pleasure to be with all of you. And today, what we might consider doing in the brief span of time which we have at our disposal is to really give you a bird's eye view of the law of contracts. This particular branch of law is not only extremely interesting. but also very very useful because whether you realize or you don't we are entering into contracts every day of our lives and not just once but many many times in one day so this is where the subject gets very interesting very important because if you are entering into contracts all your life we should all know what are the rights duties liabilities of both the parties we will also talk about e contracts which jay mentioned but let me tell jay that in 1872 when the contract act came into force there was nothing like e commerce and therefore no emails no computers so obviously the framers of the act could not have provided for this but what is most interesting is that the same rules can profitably be applied to e-commerce to e-contracts we'll come to that little later today what i would like to go through is a series of steps which lead you right up to the last step which is contracts the second last step is the concept of an agreement for lay people agreement and contract it almost amounts to the same thing people come and say oh my uncle entered into a partnership agreement actually that is a contract so what is the difference between the second last step and the last any agreement which can be taken to a court of law any agreement which can be enforced in a court of law becomes a contract and therefore an agreement to smuggle or an agreement to give in local language to give a sopari for my political rival obviously will be an agreement but it cannot be a contract it cannot be taken to a court of law so what is the very first step in the formation of a contract it's the concept of what the contract act calls a proposal 
English law prefers the word offer, but both mean the same. We don't have to bother about that. It is not very easy to see this offer in practice. You go to a shop, you give 100 bucks, and the shopkeeper gives you a bar of chocolate. And you'll say, where is the offer? There is no offer which I can see. No, the lawyer does see an offer. At some point of time, you offered to buy the chocolate for 100 bucks. Or at some point of time, the shopkeeper offered to sell the same chocolate bar for 100 bucks. So therefore, since this is the first step in every contract, one has to see, the judge has to see if there was an offer and if it satisfied the legal connotation of an offer. Because many statements which might look like an offer really may not be an offer. In one English case, a man wanted to get a good husband for his daughter. He wanted a good son-in-law. So he said, I intend, these were his wordings, I intend to give 100 pounds to any young man who marries my daughter with my consent. One young man came, married the daughter with his consent, but he refused to pay the money. And when the case went to the court, yes, the case went to the English court. The judge said, this is not a proposal. This is not an offer. It is merely a statement of his intention. So why did he make that statement? Well, he made that statement possibly to attract some suitors for his daughter. So therefore, this was held not to be an offer. And remember, an offer is something which the other person can immediately accept by saying yes. So let's take this example. I am a very patriotic person. So I get up just now and I say, I am ready to die for my country. Well, this will not be an offer. You can't stand up and say, okay, die. Okay, you cannot accept this offer. Therefore, there has to be an offer to start with. Now the question arises, to whom should this offer be made? Well, there is no rule on this point. It could be to one person. It could be to a group of people. Or it could be to everybody. Now when the offer is to everybody, in legal language, we say the offer is to the world at large. As for instance, when I want to sell my house, I will put an ad in the newspaper. This will be an offer to the world at large. Only yesterday when I was taking a class on contracts, somebody gets up and says, but can you give one very, very poignant illustration, relevant illustration of an offer to only one person? I said, yes, the best thing I can think of is a marriage offer. You don't get up and say, come on, anybody wants to marry me. No, the offer will be addressed to one particular person. Also, it is important that this offer must reach that person. So if I am in my classroom and a student has walked out of the classroom and I offer to sell my pen to all the people who are present, this student who is outside the classroom, the offer has not reached him. And therefore, there is no question of contract. In 1872, when the act was framed, the post office was the only mode of communication. So if I have an offer which I have posted to you, but thanks to the efficiency of the post office, you never get my letter, the offer has not reached you. And very interestingly, we can apply the same principle to an email. There was no email in 1872. But if I write an email to you, 
and for some reason the email just does not reach you. The offer has not reached. But the point is that we will try to apply the 1872 rules to email contracts also. And email contracts have been recognized by law courts. I personally feel that the time has come when the Contract Act should have a separate small chapter on e-contracts. Because today there are so many e-contracts, especially after COVID, there are so many e-contracts. Unfortunately, this is not done. There are a few provisions in the Information Technology Act and in the Indian Evidence Act about e-signatures, e-communication, but I think it would be very nice if specific rules are spelled out for e-contracts. Now, what is the second step? After the offer is made, obviously, if nobody accepts the offer, the whole thing is finished. I want to sell my pen, but nobody wants to buy my pen. So therefore, the second step, which we are going to see, is acceptance. And the law is very particular about the nature of acceptance. And it says, now this is legal language, that the acceptance should be absolute and unconditional. If you want to put it in simple English, the acceptance should be just one word. Yes. Full stop. This is called the mirror rule of acceptance. You cannot change even one small part of the proposal. If you do, that is not acceptance. So there should be no yes, but, blah, blah. No. It cannot be yes, if, blah, blah. No, that cannot be accepted. You just have to say yes. Now, suppose I want to deliver my pen to you for a particular price at 5 o'clock. And you say that, yes, I'm ready, to willing, ready and willing to buy, but I will take the pen at 5.30. This is not yes, full stop. Therefore, it is not acceptance. Now, if it is not acceptance, what is it? It is a counter of. You are now making an offer to me to buy the pen at 5.30. You did not accept the mirror rule which I had laid down. This is one part. The second part is that the acceptance must come in the mode which I have specified. So if I say, please accept by registered letter, you might say, oh, if I send an email, it's faster. If I make a phone call, it's faster. No, the law says it has to be by a registered letter. And if you send the acceptance in any other mode, then I have the right not to accept your acceptance. But if I keep quiet, for a reasonable period of time, the law says that I have accepted your acceptance despite the fact that it was not in the manner which I want. Next question is, who can accept? Well, obviously, this is a very common sense thing. Only the person to whom the proposal was sent can accept. A person to whom I have not addressed the proposal cannot obviously accept. Now, till acceptance comes, the law gives me the right to withdraw, to retract the proposal. So therefore, if I want to sell this pen to you, I would say, would anybody like to buy this pen for 50 rupees? Anybody wants to buy? Nobody answers. If nobody answers, I can retract, withdraw, 
revoke the proposal. But once acceptance comes, see, this is the proposal, right? This is acceptance. And it comes and catches. You will be able to appreciate that I'm not able to pull my hand away. Why? Because acceptance has come and stuck itself on the proposal. Next question which arises is, how soon should the acceptance come? Within the next 10 minutes, 10 hours, 10 days? Well, that depends. The proposal itself may lay this down. Would somebody like to buy this pen? My offer is open only for 24 hours. Now, once 24 hours are over, I don't have to come and make another announcement and say, oh, now there is no offer. My offer expires at that period which I have stipulated. But the interesting question is, what if I never stipulated any period? Then the law says that your offer will expire after the lapse of a reasonable period of time. For good reasons, the law does not define what is reasonable period of time. One day, one minute, two days, one week, no. But obviously, if I had offered this pen to you and you said nothing about it, and you meet me on the road after 10 years and so oh, now I'm accepting, the law will say, that, no, sorry, you cannot accept because more than reasonable time has elapsed. Now, as far as e-contracts are concerned, we apply the same rules of proposal and acceptance. And you will realize that many of us are now entering into e-contracts more than ever before. And we find that there are three forms of e-contracts. The first one is called browse wrap agreements. There, the terms and conditions appear on your website. And you are supposed to go through them, and these are binding on you. B R O W S E, browse wrap contracts. The second is what is called shrink, S H R I N K, shrink wrap contracts. This is generally for software. And when you open the package of the software, you will see terms and conditions by which the manufacturer seeks to protect himself. But the third category is the most common. It is called click, C-L-I-C-K. Click, wrap, contracts. This is what happens when you open the site and it says terms and conditions. Kindly go through all our terms and conditions and mind you these terms and conditions go into pages and pages and at the last page there is one small box. I agree. Okay. I agree to these terms and conditions. Now, I'm sure all of you must have had this experience that we don't have either the time or the intention to spend another half an hour reading all those terms and conditions. So we just go to the end and you take your mouse and you click, I agree. Question is, if you have not read those terms and conditions and still you click, I agree, are those terms and conditions binding on you? Answer is yes. You could have read those terms and conditions. You should have read those terms and conditions. And it's your problem if you did not read it. Same thing happens when there is no e-contract. I want a Vodafone connection, so I go to the Vodafone shop and they give me a printed list of terms and conditions. This is what is known as a standard form contract. And I have to sign at the bottom. Whether I have read or I have not read. 
all those terms and conditions will be binding unless the court finds that it is manifestly unjust or against public policy. So these are documents which seem to tell the customer, take it or leave it. You want a Vodafone connection? These terms and conditions will apply. If you are not happy with even one of the terms and conditions, we are not going to change it for you. Forget the Vodafone connection. Talking of computers and people entering into contracts on computers, there are two very famous cases which come to mind. One is the Kodak case, where a camera was priced 329 pounds. By mistake, the website showed 100 pounds. Thousands of viewers clicked for the e-purchase. By the time Kodak realized the mistake and they shut it down, already people had clicked and wanted to buy the contract. Initially, Kodak tried to get out of this by saying, no, 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 this is a mistake. How can we sell a camera for 100 pounds when it is 329? But I think later on, the legal advisors must have advised them that if you start fighting this matter in the courts, it will be even more expensive. So actually, in that particular year, Kodak's profits took a blow because of this. The second case, which happened in US when I was there, there is a famous airlines called US Airways. By mistake, they showed their tickets to a particular destination for one dollar. One dollar. And people who are lucky to open their laptops at that particular point of time, they just clicked. Come on, who else will give you a ticket for one dollar? And mind you, the airways honor the ticket. Because it is one thing to fight in a court of law. And it is quite another thing to look after your reputation and say that, okay, if it is my mistake, why should the customer suffer for this? And mind you, the law of contracts, forget e-contracts, the law of contracts says that as long as both the parties consent, the price, the actual price of that thing is not even relevant. Which means that if I am foolish enough to sell this pen for one rupee, it's binding on me. Conversely, if you are foolish enough to buy this pen for a lack of rupees, it is binding on you. As long as there is no golmal, no fraud, no coercion, and the contract was willingly entered into. I happen to remember a friend of mine who comes down to India from Texas almost every year and he always stays at the ITC hotel. He was planning to stay for six days and normally his room charges with breakfast would be about, I don't know, 12,000, 13,000. So he was just browsing through the various types of rooms and he came across what is the best suite in ITC? It is called the President's Suite. The price is 1 lakh 10,000 rupees. By mistake, on the website, 1 zero was missed. And it was offered to him for 11,000 rupees. And he says, nothing like this. I'm going to stay for six days. And when you click six days, it shows at 66,000 rupees. And believe me, he came and stayed in the best suite in the ITC for six days and he paid only 66,000 rupees. 
And in fact, when he mentioned this, he was very honest. He mentioned this to the manager. The manager said, well, I'm very sorry. We'll go into a loss. But if I offer something for 11,000, my corporate policy says that if it is my mistake, we will not penalize the customer. So therefore, all of us really should be on a lookout for these computer mistakes and buy things at a cheap price. Now, the next requirement is not in the law. It is not there in the contract act. It is developed by the English courts. And I can tell you that 90% of Indian contract law follows English law. This requirement is that when the proposal and acceptance is made, both the parties must intend to create a legal relationship between them. If this intention is not there, it is not a contract. And in one very famous English case, the husband who was in civil service was posted to Sri Lanka. His wife could not join him because of her health problems, she had rheumatic arthritis, and the climate of Ceylon would be bad for her. So he said that I'll give you 30 pounds, I'll send you 30 pounds every week. When this money didn't come, yes, the wife filed a suit against him. The court said, wait a minute, this is not a contract. This is a purely domestic family arrangement. Why? Because the intention to create a legal relationship was not there. But please note that this does not mean that every arrangement between a husband and wife cannot be a contract. It can be. And there are many cases. If a husband sells a car to his wife, it's like anybody selling a car to anybody. The only point is that the court will see that at the point, at the time when the contract was entered into, was there an intention in the minds of the parties to create a legal relationship? The, th the next requirement, so this is the next step, is that both the parties should be competent to enter into a contract. Now, competency takes three forms. Number one, for every domiciled Indian, he should be 18 years old. This is the age of majority under the Indian Majority Act. Therefore, if there is a minor who is 17 and a half, and this boy has a big beard and big body and he looks 19, still his agreement will be void. He was not a major at the time of entering into a country. When I go on particular websites, I find that there is one more box there which says, I am over 18 years of age. And then you have to click that box. Now I wonder what actually happens. How will that owner of the website know that this boy is only 17. If he has clicked on that box, it does not mean that he becomes 18. He will still be a minor. Number two for capacity is sound mind. You should be of sound mind when you enter into the contract. Now, what is the meaning of sound mind? The contract act says that you must be able to realize what you are doing and to understand the effect of that contract. For example, if a man is staying in the house and is selling it for a crore of rupees, he should realize that the house will go away and one crore of rupees will come to him and then next day he will be without a house. He should realize all this. 
Therefore, we can, I would like you to give this a thought. Can we therefore say that a man who is in a lunatic asylum, committed to the lunatic asylum, he cannot make a contract. Why? Because he is not of sound mind. And the law says no. What is important is, what is the state of his mind at the time he entered into the country? And it's a very accepted maxim of psychology that even the man in the lunatic asylum has got what is called lucid intervals. That means for 10-15 minutes is perfectly normal. And the law says for at least 10-15 minutes, he can enter into a country. And the reverse is also true. People like you and me, we are not in the mental asylum. But can a man enter into a contract when he is completely drunk? The answer is no. He is not of sound. Or if he is under the influence of drugs or alcohol, he is not of sound. Unfortunately, there are some people who get what is known as epileptic fits. The person cannot think. So even a normal person can be of unsound mind for some time, just as a lunatic can also be of sound mind for a particular period of time. What is important is, and this is a matter of proof, the judge will call for proof. What is important is, what was the state of his mind when he entered into that country? The third rule on competency is that there should not be any law which prohibits him from entering into the contract. For example, insolvency laws. Once a man is declared insolvent, the court will order that this man will not be allowed to enter into any commercial contract. What is the next step? The next step is that there should be free consent. Now, these are two things. One is consent, which means both the parties must agree to the same thing in the same sense. In Latin, we call it consensus ad item. If I have got three or four race horses and you want to buy one of them, I am thinking of horse A, but you are thinking of horse B. Our minds don't meet. We are not thinking of the same thing in the same sense. And therefore, there will be no contract at all. Why? Because I think I am selling one horse. You think you are buying another horse. Our minds are not at the same level. But consent is not enough. It should be free consent. Let's say that I hold a gun against you and make you sign a piece of paper where you are buying my house for double the market price. Now your signature is there. Mind you, I have not used the gun. I just pointed the gun at you. Your consent is there. You cannot say my consent is not there because your signature is there. But it is not free consent. And what happens when it is not free consent? You can go to the court, prove that I was holding a gun against you, and the court will cancel that contract. This type of contract is called avoidable contract. It's interestingly a mixture of a valid and a void contract. It's valid to start with because otherwise everybody will say, oh, there was a gun. No, you have to go to the court and the court has to declare it to be a voidable contract and strike it down. That is not so in the case of a minor's agreement. A minor's agreement, to use a Latin expression, is void ab initio. 
ab initio means from the very beginning. A court does not have to declare it to be void. By very nature, a minor is to be protected. This is the reasoning behind this. A minor can take some benefits under the contract, but he cannot be subject to any liability. Very often, a question is raised as to whether every contract should be in writing. Now, the layman may feel that, yes, if it is going to be a valid contract, it should be in writing. But no, when we go to buy some biscuits or chocolate, we don't make a contract in writing. When you travel by a taxi or by a train, you don't often make the contract in writing. So, the Contract Act has got a very interesting provision on this point. It says that as far as the Contract Act is concerned, writing is not necessary. But if any other law wants the contract to be in writing, then it will be valid only if it is in writing. Which means that if I make a contract to sell this pen, I need not make it in writing. But if I make a contract to sell my house, mortgage my house, lease my house, then the Transfer of Property Act will say that your contract should be in writing. And the same rule applies as to whether there should be witnesses to attest the contract only if required by law, and whether the contract should be registered under the Registration Act, once again, the answer is only if required by law. Then we go to a very important step before we reach the final step, and that in law is called consideration. Consideration is the return which I get for my contract. I give 100 rupees because in return, I will get a bar of chocolate. The shopkeeper gives me a chocolate because in return, he gets 100 rupees. So this is consideration. And therefore, if the shopkeeper says that I'll give you a chocolate and you don't give me any money, this will not be a contract. If I say that I'll give you 100 rupees, but it does not give me anything, this will not be consideration. The law says that offer and acceptance are merely the outer facets of a contract. But the presence of consideration shows that the parties really had the intention to enter into a contract. Not only should there be consideration, but it should also be lawful consideration. I cannot tell somebody to go and beat up a political rival whom I don't like and tell him that if you are made to pay damages, I will pay you that money. No. That would not be lawful. So, therefore, there has to be lawful consideration. If all these conditions are satisfied, we will reach the second last step, and that is agreement. If the agreement is of such a nature that it can be enforced in a court of law, that agreement will become a contract. This also means that all agreements are not contracts. But all contracts, yes, are agreements. And if I may just go back to the first step where I told you that every contract starts with a proposal. Well, let me modify this sentence and say almost every contract starts with a proposal. Why? Because there are certain types of contracts which do not start with a proposal. 
and this is a very interesting branch of law called quasi or quasi contracts. Two people who have never entered into a contract, the law says that we will presume, we will deem it that you have entered into a contract and then you have therefore rights and liabilities and if you don't comply, the other party can go to court. I'll just give you one example of this. I stay in a bungalow on rent. Now, I pay the rent to the owner of the bungalow very regularly. It is the owner's duty to pay the taxes, ground rent and all the other taxes and cesses, which he does not pay. Mind you, I have not defaulted, but he does not pay the tax. Now, what does the law say? The law says, for example, that if taxes are not paid for five years, the government can auction that bungalow and recover the taxes. Obviously, after throwing out the person who is inside the bungalow. So, ultimately, I will suffer because he has not paid the tax. And I have paid my rent regularly. So, what do I do? I go and pay the taxes. Now, if I file a suit to recover this amount, the owner may say, who asked you to pay? I did not tell you that you go and pay and then I will pay you back. But the law says, no, sorry. We will apply equitable principles. What is just and fair? We will apply the doctrine of unjust enrichment. And we will deem as if the two of you entered into a contract. Oh, but I have never entered into this contract. Does not matter. So therefore, our act, contract act, recognizes five types of quasi-contracts. Very interesting. Two people have not entered into a contract, but the law says we don't care. It is as if you entered into a contract. Now what happens when somebody breaks a contract. This is known as breach of contract. I agree to sell my house. You are ready with the money, but I am not giving you the house. Or vice versa. I am ready with the house, but you are not paying me the money. The law gives us four remedies in case of breach of contract. Number one is damages or compensation. And this will be easier to understand if we take an example where I agree to sell you 100 bales of cotton at 1,000 rupees per bale. On the day of performance, I find that the market is 1,200. I tell myself, I'm a businessman. I'm not some silly fellow to suffer a loss and I go and sell the same bales of cotton in the market. What is the extra profit which I make? 200 rupees per bale. Now you did not get cotton from me. So you have to go to the market. How much more do you pay than what you would have paid me? Again the same amount. 200 rupees per bale. Therefore if you go to court you will get a mathematically calculated amount of compensation. I made 200 rupees extra. You lost 200 rupees multiplied by 1000 bills. My illegal profit is the same as your loss. Once this money is paid to you, then it is as good as selling it to you for a contract price. Number two, a remedy, which is not there in the Contract Act, but is in a separate act. It's called the Specific Relief Act. Number two remedy is specific performance. If I agree to sell you the house and you are ready with the money, but I don't give you the house, compensation in money may not solve the problem because there is no other house which is available. So therefore, the court will say, we are ordering you 
to deliver the house as per the terms and conditions of the contract. There is one type of contract where specific performance will not be allowed, and that is a personal contract. There was a case in England where a singer agreed to sell, sing at a restaurant every evening. She did not. And the court said, sorry, we cannot make her sing. This is a personal contract. But we have the third remedy of a breach of contract, and that is injunction. Chances are that she is not coming here because she is getting a better offer at some other place. So the court issues an injunction stopping her from going to any other place to sing. Look at it practically. We could not give specific performance, but this injunction has almost the same effect. Either she does not go there and comes here or she stays at home and loses the little amount also which she would be getting. So therefore, this is the third remedy. And the last remedy is a Latin expression called quantum merit. Quantum merit means as much as he has deserved. And I'll just give you one example of this. Where a man who was an expert in arms and ammunition, he was requested to write a chapter on ancient arms and ammunitions for an encyclopedia. And he was promised 100 pounds for his effort. Sometime later, the company abandoned the idea of publishing the encyclopedia. So they told that man, don't work any further. We are not having any encyclopedia. But the man says, but what about what I've already done? No, no, we won't pay you. There is no encyclopedia. The man went to court. The court tried to find out exactly how much work he had put in. And it was not his fault. He was ready to continue. The court found out that he had put in about half the labor which he otherwise would have done. So the court ordered the company to pay him 50 pounds, exactly half the amount which was promised to him. As far as damages are concerned, let me make it very clear that we follow the English rule which says only natural damages, damages which arise naturally will be payable. So if I don't get cotton for a thousand rupees a bale and the market price is 1,200, I will get the difference of these two amounts, which is 200 rupees. But I cannot say that because I didn't get the cotton, my mill had to close. And therefore, I am losing lakhs and lakhs of rupees. No, everybody who buys cotton does not have a mill. And therefore, these are not natural damage. You had to pay me a loan. You had to pay back a loan, which I had given you, of 20 lakhs of rupees. And you don't pay it to me. The result is that I go bankrupt. My creditors pull me into bankruptcy. I cannot claim from you damages for my bankruptcy. The simple thing is, everybody who is not paid 50 lakhs or 10 lakhs does not become bankrupt. So therefore, only damages which are normal and which naturally arise can be recovered. If you want to recover something which is more than this, which is called extraordinary damages, the other party should have been informed by you at the time of making the fund. Then you can. And also the law says that remote and indirect loss because of breach of contract can never be recovered. So this, in short, is the law of contracts. 
Very well, sir. Thank you so much uh, for your valuable insights, sir, for taking out session. I'm sure this Thank session you. will uh, immensely benefit all the viewers who are watching. Sir, uh, only if you have the time, I just have one question. Sure. And I won't take more than uh, one minute to finish. Sure. Uh, sir, uh, this was with respect to non-complete clauses yes. and negative covenants, sir. Um, and often we see, you know, a lot of times these clauses in agreements and contracts and e-contracts in particular, so do you think that they are in violation or uh, in gross violation of Article 191G that guarantees right to practice any profession, which is a fundamental right, or carry on any occupation, trade or business? And uh, what's the difference ba basically between uh, a negative covenant and non-compete clauses? Or, uh, you know, are, do they fall under Section 27 of the Indian Contract Act? And uh, if you could sir, is, throw some light yeah. Now, as far as Section 27 is concerned, and I'm very glad that you asked that question, because 26 to 30 are five types of agreements which are not allowed by the law, by the Contract Act itself. And one of them is any agreement in restraint of trade. Another is an agreement in restraint of marriage. Another is an agreement in restraint of legal proceedings. You also mentioned Article 19, my freedom to carry on any trade profession or business. Dealing with Article 19, please remember that no freedom given by the Constitution or for that matter, no freedom given in any part of the world is unlimited freedom. There are reasonable restrictions which can be imposed under Article 19 itself on your freedom to carry on any trade profession or business. Otherwise, many people will claim that smuggling is my trade. It is my profession. How can you stop me from smuggling? There was a case which went right up to the Supreme Court where the question was, gambling. Can anybody claim that this is his right to carry on the profession of gambling? And the court said, sorry, this cannot be so. Now, as far as as restraints on employment are concerned, there's a very famous case of Niranjan Golikari versus Century Spinning, which went right up to the Supreme Court. This gentleman was working with this Birla company, Century Spinning, and they offered to send him to Germany at their cost. All the expenses were to be paid by the company. But one condition was there that when he comes back, he must work with the company for at least five years. And if he does not, there were certain consequences. For example, he could not take up a job with a rival company. He could not start his own and he would have to pay some compensation. And the court upheld this stipulation. When he came back, and he wanted to start his own business, the court stopped him. The logic is very clear, and the same logic will apply to non-disclosure clauses. This man gets training at the expense of century spinning. And when he comes back, would it be fair that he uses that expertise for a rival? This is the question. I get all secret information and intellectual property secrets from one company. Tomorrow, am I allowed to shift myself to another company and spill out all these secrets to them? Secrets which were developed by the first company. And then I'm reminded of another case which went to the Supreme Court where 
the stipulation was that after you leave the company for the next two years you will not be allowed to work with a competitor or on your own in the same city now the court said that there's a difference between the first case and the second case the first is a restraint during employment and in the second case it's a restraint after employment so the supreme court handed down a judgment saying that restraints after employment cannot be tolerated but restraints during employment take a very simple thing suppose there is a bank clerk will he ever be allowed to work in another bank during his spare time will your law firm say okay on sundays you go and work with my rival law firm <laughs> that cannot happen and it should not happen but for non disclosure and non compete clauses please note that there are other laws like the competition act and the provisions of the competition act will also apply and each case will be examined not only from the angle of fundamental rights that you mentioned also section 27 which you mentioned and also all the provisions of the competition act okay so i hope that answers your question and lastly sir before we wrap this uh, special segment on the law of contracts if you can share your experiences talk about your experiences of drafting uh, yeah. you know the foreign law of uh, oh. government of bhutan sir yeah in fact that was a very interesting and surprising thing that happened to me more than 10 years ago i was sitting in my office and in those days the government of bhutan used to send used to sponsor bhutani students to government law college for some reason that has stopped now i think and one of my students had become the deputy attorney general of bhutan and i got a call from him sir can we come and see you next week the first thought that came to me was this must be some foreign collaboration or some advice that he needs but when he came i was shocked i was shocked for two things he said can you please draft a contract act for our country it was more shocking to hear that 10 or 12 years ago there was no contract law in that country and my first reaction was have you come to the right place have you come to the right person and he said very frankly that we have a draft which an american lawyer has prepared so if you can please go through that draft we'll be very happy to have your suggestion i said okay let me go through it overnight you see me tomorrow there come all the way from bhutan when they came back and had gone through the draft i told them that if we are going to use this draft we will have to alter almost every line of this this was done in a typical american fashion with which they were not satisfied and i was not satisfied so i said why not draft a contract law for bhutan on the basis of our law the indian contract act which will give you the additional advantage of supreme court decisions of india which will also give you the additional advantage of english case law because our act is based on english law the deputy attorney general told me that look this is not in my hands i will have to ask my boss the attorney general and we'll get back to you tomorrow i'll phone him up next day he comes to my office with a smile on his face and he says yes sir we can do it and that's how the whole journey started we sat down in india most of the time to draft the law and i'll tell you what i told them i said that there are a few defects in the indian contract act 
a few loopholes. I would like to plug those loopholes and give you what I would consider the best contract act. And then I went to Bhutan and then we had a meeting for some days. And I expected that in those meetings and workshops, I would be meeting all kinds of lawyers. But no, I met all kinds of businessmen. And I said, how many practicing lawyers do you have in your country? There was no answer. I repeated the question. And they said, sir, only two or three. Why? Because most of the students who do law, they join the government. And then we had a dinner party where my students who had become judges in Bhutan came for that dinner. So it was really delightful to meet all these people. And I want to tell you one more thing. Bhutan is a beautiful country. The people are even more lovely. And they have developed what is called the happiness index. We talk of gross national profit and other things by which we measure our economic growth. They say it is much better to measure your happiness growth. And therefore, today we have that act in force. But what is very striking, and I may want to mention that to you, they could not bring the act into force for almost a period of five to six years. And when I asked them what is the problem, they said, translation. They did not have enough Bhutanese vocabulary for several words in English. So they came out with an act which I have got on the left-hand side, it is in Bhutanese language. On the right-hand side, everything is in English. Okay, so I am not trying to promote Bhutan. But if you get a chance, you must visit that place. Yes, Jay, I hope you are a happy man now. Sir my happiness index has exponentially gone up sir after this session because i'm so happy that uh, this session could happen i could make it possible uh, you know it's it's it's, it's such a big also, day for the viewers also family. no opinion. yes all the best thank you so much sir to all the viewers of watching email is mentioned on the channel in case if you have any queries feel free to write to us thank you so much sir Prof professor sir for taking our time for doing this session really means a lot it's goodbye for now. Thank you. Sir. It is my pleasure and I would like to wish all my viewers good luck. And what is more important these days, I would like to wish them good health. All the best. Take care. Thank you, sir.